How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Very good. good. I appreciate you coming around. It's, it's a pretty cool topic. I've been doing water quality for a lot of years. A lot of years. I, I did my bachelor's uh, in medical microbiology, my master's in environmental microbiology, and that was in uh, 1980 through 1986. So then I went on to be head of microbiology for Clorox for six years, and then I came back to the university. So I've been around the game. Right now, my biggest expertise is, is probably mold. I, I chase hurricanes and tornadoes around. I've uh, been all over, the, all over the world dealing with uh, mold. So that could be another topic for you. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, we'll just get into water tonight. So how many of you people are on the uh, the community distribution system. Okay, and, and the rest of you have your own private wells. Yeah. Yeah. Outstanding, outstanding. Well, I'm a resource, sure. and definitely I'll have some cards. If we don't get your questions answered tonight, I want to make sure that you guys have contact and you can give me a call, email, um, my cell phone, whatever. Because well water is is pretty complex, really overall. So how many people have been on a well for less than five years? Excellent. And five to ten years? Okay. And again, these folks are your experts too because they've gone through some of the same nasty things that the beginners will probably be going through. Uh, my wife Bobby and I live at Deer Meadow and we've been up here, what, 10, 12 years? 11 years. So we're kind of in that we've got it going mode, but we haven't had anything real catastrophic happen to us yet. So, but as far as working at the university, I've been there 28 years now, and we test well water. Well, we test a little bit of everything, let me tell you. So this is, this is what we do. We offer microbiology, micro services right now. Um, in the rare quality, we test all of the water systems on campus. We test the pools and spas on campus. We test uh, food quality in the residents all over responsible for any foodborne outbreaks. So basically, I'm just a big bug nerd. Anything that is with microbiology, I uh, really dig it. You know, people kind of get, you know, it's, for me, the five second rule is more like the, yeah, minute or so rule, because it really doesn't matter. It's all, it's all pretty safe. But water, we're pretty much experts on water. And again, it's going to be mostly the microbiology. When it comes down to the bugs, I can tell you everything there is to know about bugs. If you're worried about the chemistry, we'll talk a little bit about the chemistry this evening. It'll be more my colleague in the soil water and plant testing lab. They have the ability to do the chemical testing where we have just some very, very basic nitrate, sulfate, that sort of thing. They can tell you the arsenic, the lead, everything, if you're curious about it. So, but anyway, um, wastewater, you know, pretty much anything that has bugs in it, we take a look at. So, obviously, this is probably pretty basic information. There are three types and sources of water. Really, the first is surface water. Fort Collins uses entirely surface water, whereas some of the towns out in eastern Colorado are strictly on wells. Most of Nebraska is on wells of some type. Even major communities have wells, just like you folks do. So well water is a principal source for a majority of the people in the United States. The surface water is kind of quite a bit more tricky because you don't know where the water came from. The problem with surface water up here, we're primary users. The water that we drink, the water that we shower with, has never gone through another person. In Fort Collins, they're primary users. The water comes down the pooter or from horse tooth, they're primary users. No one has ever drank that water before. If you take a look in Denver, Denver is typically a secondary user. Every single drop of water that someone in Denver drinks has gone through one person. If you go down along the Mississippi, that's why they're not going to be up there. If you go down along the Mississippi, in New Orleans, every drop of water has gone through at least 15 people already. We're primary users. And even better, we have groundwater. Groundwater is usually perfectly pristine. Now, we have some water, groundwater, that's a little bit trickier. Wells um, are, are great, but springs can be problematic. Any of you guys are working with a spring? I know a couple of you have springs up here, but you may not be here. So springs are a little bit more of a challenge. They're more seasonally effective because they're shallow. One of our neighbors has a 12 foot well. So some of them, some of the hand dug wells, the old school wells 
can be a real problem. Some of the very much deeper wells, like, like yours, is you know, 650 feet. Ours is 340 feet deep. So usually with that kind of depth, you're never really going to have to worry about something coming in through the aquifer. Usually the aquifers are very pure. As the water percolates down through layers and layers and layers of rock, it purifies itself. And so in order to get that contaminated, it's usually from your own well that causes the contamination. Yes? What is that kind of break point as for the depth of your well? So as, as, far as, as far as the safety, the protection, yeah. usually a shallow well is considered anything under 50 feet. Oh, okay. So you, and some of the more shallow ones, uh, the Livermore Community Hall has, what, a 15 foot well. So very much more of a challenge when you have shallower wells. And we'll talk about that a little bit as far as well prevention. You shouldn't have water sloped into your wellhead. Very, very simple characteristics of how to protect your well. You can't have water running down the casing, down the outside of the casing, but again, easy to protect for. And then of course, we worry about reclaimed water, uh, desalination, something that we, got, we don't have to worry about at all, but you know, other communities definitely don't have the quality of water that we do or the availability of water. And essentially what we have now is all we're going to get. Unless, of course, we figure out how to mine asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big science fiction man, so yeah. Yeah, All the water we need is out there. <laughs> okay, so well water. Number one, it tastes better. As long as you don't have really nasty sulfate water. But there's a way to fix that. It's more healthy. It provides more base nutrients, more uh, minerals, trace minerals. So it's a much more healthy water, even than the water in Fort Collins. Fort Collins water is excellent, but they actually have to add minerals back into the water to keep it from leaching all of the pipes. So well water is generally healthier, very much less expensive. Bottled water, I'm a real uh, soapbox against bottled water. Everybody had bottled water. We have buckets of bottled water for when the electricity goes out. I mean, that's something a townie doesn't think about. Well, we have well water, we'll never run out of water. Well, as soon as you don't have electricity. <laughs> so, everybody has bottled water, but the cost of it, the purity of it. Now, drinking water is regulated by the EPA. Bottled water is regulated by the FDA. The FDA says, well, the EPA's got a pretty good idea, so we'll make sure that the standard for coliform bacteria is the same, which is zero. They have no standard whatsoever on background or heterotrophic bacteria. So some of the bottled waters out there are essentially a probiotic. They have so much background bacteria in there that they're, that they're absolutely loaded. Again, the EPA's recommended limit is 500 per mil as far as background bacteria. That may seem like quite a lot, but a lot of these bottled waters, you'll have 10,000 per mil. And how do you tell that by looking at the bottle? You can. It's, it's completely clear. You'd have to run it into my lab and I can tell you. The other one that we've had problem with on campus, and we've essentially gotten rid of 90% of them, is the five gallon jug that sits in everybody's office. So if you guys have one of those, make sure you are meticulous about cleaning it. Same thing, I mean, anytime you have water that sits, the resident bugs in there, the bugs that are essentially not a problem, they can be good for you, they're, they're part of the normal flora of your body, but once they sit stagnant, they can multiply millions of times. So if you have a water dispenser, make sure you keep it clean. Yes, sir? You may be on a mission, but what's the deal on the plastic that they were talking about it? The PBAs, polybenzyl, yada yada yada. So most, most of these plastic bottles have, uh, will, will actually in the sun or in, the, in higher temperatures, will leach that plastic into the water. So, you know, the, 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 the rule of thumb is never leave your plastic bottle water in the car. Because the hotter it gets, the more of these, these toxins and, and some of the known carcinogens will leach into the bottle water. It's all well and good, and they're leaving your thing in the car, but there's, from the, from the time that that bottle is manufactured, filled, it goes through shipping, warehousing, pretty much everything else, where the temperature abuse is never regulated. 
So it, it can become a problem. A lot of them really will, a lot of the plastics are going to a, a non-PBA, they'll say on the plastic on there. So, but some of the, you know, different manufacturers haven't concerned themselves with it. But, it, but it's good to avoid. Um, environmentally sustainable, I've got, a, I've got a whole little sub lecture on why not to drink bottled water, but essentially we're dealing with 28 billion bottles per year that are landfill. But it is a responsibility. Well, water's a challenge, as you all know. You have to deal with microbial problems, potentially protozoa, algae, of course chemical, well, natural <coughs> Um, organic. This time of year we get a little bit of brown in the water perhaps. Um, humic acid, where do you put the well? If you're putting in a new well, how far away from the septic tank is it, is it going to be? What's your source? About your pump, what happens if your pump fails? What happens if the well fails? Um, cisterns, how many of you guys have cisterns? Okay, it's pretty common. And again, that can be problematic. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, and we'll talk a little bit more about the cisterns as we go along. There's ways to protect your cistern, and some of the cisterns absolutely have to have it. And then of course, taste and odor, which comes back to all of these, and, and then some. We were talking here just before we started, sometimes well water can taste bad, absolutely. In fact, if you, if you're, if you spend any time in New Orleans or the South, the tap water tastes bad. It's that, it's that hydrogen sulfide that you get in there. Fortunately, that's a very fixable problem. What about if it's kind of slimy? <laughs> the sliminess in the water is absolutely fixable as well. That's probably bacteria that are causing that sliminess. And again, very fixable. But a good question. So, bugs. The favorite part for me are the bugs. So, where do we get contamination? Obviously, from septic systems from other sources, from, from cattle. And again, in a very deep well, we don't really have to worry about that as much. This actually was a problem on the Poudre River. This was uh, just a, an outhouse up there on the Poudre. We found high contamination in the water, and lo and behold, we worked all our, our way back, all the way up the Poudre, and found a broken ball. Yeah. I can't say the word, but things happen. <laughs> <laughs> it comes to well. Uh, so, and of course, you know, agriculture, anything can contaminate that well microbially, <laughs> and probably one of the biggest contaminations in your well is the well system itself. These, uh, water gets, have, has bacteria. These bacteria, once they get in an anoxic environment, all the way down at the bottom of the well, no oxygen, they can start producing hydrogen sulfide, iron reducing bacteria, you'll get the black slime, you'll get a, a slimy feel to it, Easy enough to correct, you just have to shock the well. People think, well, my potability test is coming out fine. I have zero coliforms. But there are other problems that we can get into. And the big one probably is this guy here. This is the one we really kind of test for. E. coli is an indicator of, of other pathogens. So the standard is coliform bacteria. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Coliform bacteria is a general group of bacteria. It includes, well, they define it by how it does on the media. It ferments lactose and produces gas or produces green colonies. But essentially anything that does this is called a coliform. Coliforms can come from all over the place. But if we have coliforms, we have to look for E. coli. If we have E. coli, then we have to start looking for some of the other nasty ones, the cholera, the typhi, the shigella, things like that. Indicator organisms, and that's really, <coughs> excuse me, one of the holy grails that an environmental microbiologist looks for. They're trying to find, instead of trying to cure the next disease, we're trying to find the indicator that will indicate everything. So E. coli is a pretty good indicator. It tells us if we have E. coli in there, it's guaranteed fecal contamination. E. coli cannot survive out of the body for long periods of time. We hear about it in meat. We hear about it in, you know, large pools. Yeah, lettuce. 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 Yeah, lettuce. Rose. Yeah, you can't eat from your nose. Absolutely. Lettuce, things like that. And again, those are coming from the water. That's one of the main things that the agricultural industry is changing. Within the next two years, all growers uh, beyond family growers 
will have to test their wash water for washing the produce for E. coli. And that's something that's being forced now by the FDA. I guarantee there's a lot of farmers in Colorado, and in fact throughout the United States, that are going, how am I going to do that? But it is, we are indicating that if we have E. coli in there, it's fecal contamination. If you have fecal contamination, you can have other bugs in there that you don't want, even worse than E. coli. E. coli is bad, there's some E. coli that can get you, but when there's E. coli, there's almost always some of the other guys that can get you as well. Pseudomonas is one of those little silent bugs that I have worked against in my career, my entire career. We had a bottled water company when I was working for Clorox. There were bottled water companies in Florida. Deer Park Water was owned by Clorox. We had a Pseudomonas contamination in the lines. Now Pseudomonas, in and of itself, we, we drink it all the time. It's very common, we see it two, three, four organisms per milliliter, but when it can get in high concentrations, loves hot tubs, loves spas, loves high temperature, but when it gets into high concentrations, it can create any itch imaginable. Folliculitis, otitis, any, any itis you can imagine, these guys can cause. We had a person in uh, Buckeye about two years ago. She said no matter what she does, her well is potable. We don't have any coliform bacteria whatsoever, but every time she couldn't get rid of a rash. She'd take a shower and within two days her skin would be just red everywhere. Mm -hmm. We looked at her hot water tank. Her hot water tank had become infected with pseudomonas. So pseudomonas is a little bit nastier bug to get rid of. It's the slime former. So once you form that slime, and oftentimes with cisterns, it can be a real concern. And that's why I tell folks with cisterns, if they can get in there and they feel a, a slime layer in there, it's time to disinfect that. Now one of the things with this slime layer, <clears throat> chlorine is great for disinfecting wells. But the problem is chlorine is inactivated by organic material. Or excuse me, organic material. Anytime you put chlorine and organic material together, it forms chloramines neutralizes the chlorine and you get that really nasty chlorine smell. Actually, if you smell a bottle of bleach, the only thing you're going to smell, and this is my chlorine teaching, <laughs> so if you smell a bottle of bleach, you'll smell the scent that they put in it. But if you touch it on your hands or as you pour it into your clothes, that's when you get that odor. That odor is actually chloramines and that is what is combining the chlorine and the proteins in the organic material. And neutralizes the chlorine. So pseudomonas are difficult to get rid of with chlorine. We suggest hydrogen peroxide. So the best thing to do if you have a slimy cistern is hydrogen peroxide. Just give me a call, we can talk about the concentrations you need and everything. But that's the best way to get rid of it. So anyway, that's that's one of my nemesis. Dairies have a big problem. The, the rubber O-rings in dairies become infected with pseudomonas. It's just a real challenge to get rid of. <coughs> Real common organism. Protozoa, anybody know what that guy is? GRU. Absolutely. <laughs> <coughs> this is a nasty bug. But luckily, with deep wells, we don't have to worry about GRU. Because the odds of them getting in are, are, are slim to none. Likewise with algae. Gordon and I were talking a little bit about, about algae. These guys are usually found in surface water. And in order to get into a deep aquifer, it's, it's almost impossible. The only probable sink scenario for that would be a surface water contamination down the shaft of the well, or a very shallow well, or a spring. Likewise, the same with algae. So with these guys, <laughs> the, the definition, if you hadn't heard of Giardia, the major symptom is explosive diarrhea. <laughs> I had, a, we, had, we, had, we had taken my kids to uh, camping when they, when they were little, little tiny. I had a, a baby with a diaper with giardiasis. So that was, that's how I learned about the bug. So the other ones are chemical, either natural, which we have very natural uh, concentrations of arsenic, selenium, uh, nitrates, sulfates, phosphates, that sort of thing, very, very natural. Otherwise, we have introduced chemicals, organics, lead, mercury, uh, the, uh, the azides, all of the pesticides. 
So, kind of, yeah, this is, uh, this is selenium, isn't it, Terry? It's either, so, yeah, it's, it's selenium poisoning. Interestingly enough, um, just on, on uh, just north, uh, south of Wellington, but there's very high selenium in the wells. Horses with high selenium will lose their hair. Horses with low selenium won't gain weight. So it, it's, a, it's kind of a tricky balance. People get weird lesions if the, if the selenium is too high. So unless, if your feet look like this, you probably have a selenium problem. If, if your feet don't, then you probably don't. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're kind of our own best canaries when it comes to this stuff. If we start looking bad and feeling bad, then we're probably the water. So a lot of things we don't have to worry about. Many, many areas have to worry about iron. I checked the geological survey. The geological survey has great maps of, of various aquifers. Um, and we're not a high iron area. Uh, we are a very high sulfate area. Sulfates can lead to some of that nasty sulfur taste. Um, if you have black countertops, some of the other salts, the sulfates, if you ever drop water on your countertop at night, you'll end up with a white film in the morning. And that's pretty common up here. Fluoride is a very low fluoride area. I grew up in Grand Junction, uh, which had very high fluoride. So I only had one cavity in my, uh -huh. my mouth ever. So trace minerals, some of the trace minerals are very good. And one of the concerns that I heard you folks would probably have is radon. Radon is not technically a chemical. It's, it's, it's a decay product from a chemical or, or, or a metal and uranium. But this area is typically fairly high for radon. So the, uh, I know that the community well systems are, are using a radon mitigation in the water. Now there's ways that you can test for that, and the easiest way is to look online. I, in fact, our lab does not test for radon, so I started searching for it. Walmart has a, a, a radon water testing. Uh, Home Depot has radon water testing. So if you look it up, there are, are plenty of companies that do the testing. And in fact, you can buy the test kit just like your home air radon, you buy the test kit, test it in your home, send it off to the lab, and they send you the results. So, and then what does the mitigation plan look like for something like that? <laughs> yeah. that the, mitigation, the mitigation for radon is very, very expensive. There's two ways that can be used for mitigation, and I guess you guys use kind of a, a third method, but the most common method is air stripping. Since radon is a gas, they pump bubbles of, of water in, or bubbles of air in through the water outside of your home, and it strips the radon out. The other one is granulated active, granular activated charcoal. But the problem is that charcoal will bind onto that radon, and then you end up with a glowing block in your backyard. <laughs> so you have to have somebody actually come out, moon boots, and change that charcoal. So it gets expensive, and I, and I looked up the price, Typical radon mitigation for a well is about five to six thousand dollars. Yeah, we'll <laughs> we'll get through the, the horror numbers after that. Yes, sir. Got a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm struggling with an iron bacteria in my home, and it's not coming from the well itself, but it's coming from the system in the house. No, the iron bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay. How dangerous is that? Thing? It's really not. Okay. It's um the the biggest problem with iron bacteria is it can lower the pH. And usually when it's in a well, we worry about the iron bacteria because it's gonna start uh, corroding your home. Mm -hmm. um, if, it's, if it's in the piping system, the piping. and again, a chlorine shock does a great job of getting rid of it. Yeah, I mean, I've been running like, uh, obviously if I have to put some Clorox into, mm -hmm. into the well. Absolutely. Half a cup now and then. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and that's helped keeping it down? It does help keep it down, it's getting much better. Okay, what I would recommend is trying to get it throughout your system because somewhere it's re-inoculating every time. Exactly. Yeah. If you don't if you don't get it out, it's going to keep re-inoculating on through the mm -hmm. system. So try coming back. It could be in the line between the well and the house. So you, you might want to shock the well and then make sure that every of your distribution lines, as well as your pressure pumps and everything else, are being shot. <coughs> so but iron bacteria. We use the test for iron bacteria. It's kind of a long run, it's a, it's a 21 day test, very long test. It's relatively expensive. The best way to do it is just shock your well. If you think you've got 
One of the biggest problems with, with the iron related bacteria, if it's not corroding your pump, is you'll start to see brown stains on your on your clothing. I haven't got that <laughs> but it, it's just it just creates it reduces iron. I can see it in my filter. I change, when I change my filter, it's got this. You see that that dark? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's a relatively common problem. And in fact, when we okay, here's some of the additives. <coughs> Nationally, they recommend shocking your well once a year. Um, that's that's kind of that's kind of too much in my opinion. Especially it kind of puts a, a, a hit on your septic tank, Just turn it over. a hit on your leach field. Okay, so here's some of the other ones. Now, obviously everybody's heard about Flint, Michigan and the problems that they've had with lead. The reason for that, and again, I may be telling you guys the stories that you've already heard, they changed their water system. They were, they were going on off of surface water. They were using lakes, and then they decided to change to a well. The pH of the well water was more acidic. So it started pulling lead out of the old pipes. Now that may be somewhat of a concern up here because 2014 was the absolute drop dead date for lead in construction. Now you may know because you may have constructed your house or you may have certificates showing that, but unless you have a house that's newer than 2014 and you don't know specifically about it, it would probably be a good idea to get a lead test. Uh, they used it in solder. Most people don't have actual, actual lead pipes, but uh, I've got a picture of that. Um, the lead pipes are the worst, but you also will have copper pipes that were soldered with lead. So these are very, very subjected to pH changes. Our well water up here tends to be a little bit on the alkaline side, so it should not leach lead out of your pipes but it's something that you should check. CSU do that test? CSU will do that test. Okay. Yeah, they'll do it in a soil water and plant testing. Right? So again, these are some of the ones that are introduced. We have to be careful about what we put in. Lead and copper come from the piping in your home. And again, it really depends on the pH of your water as to whether that is being leached out. Easy enough to check for, relatively inexpensive test. I think lead and copper, runs about $30, approximately. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, sir. When you say they'll say you will do that testing, when we go down and get the sample bottles, like you have done, and take that in, do they do all that? Well, you have to ask for that specifically. All you tell. Well, that's, that's a very good question. When you take... Well, when you come into my laboratory, the only thing that I'm going to do to start out is a coliform count, is a potability. That costs $25, doesn't tell you about any of the chemicals, it just tells you whether you have bacteria in there that allow you to drink it or, or allow you to not drink it. Okay? So if we're worried about the chemical tests, you have to go across the street to my colleague in the soil water and plant testing lab, and they essentially have uh, a menu of tests and you essentially request the ones that you'd like. The biggest concerns would obviously be the uh, lead and copper, pH. They have uh, their standard water package and if you look, uh, the website is the Soil Water and Plant Testing Lab and they have all of their uh, testing packages, they have all of their testing packages on their website. Their common routine water package is uh, conductivity, salinity, calcium, magnesium, sodium, pH, potassium, carbonate, bicarbonate, sulfate, nitrate, chloride, boron, hardness, alkalinity, total dissolved solids. And that's $49. Uh, I took I took a sample in earlier this year, and I asked for the most I could do. It was sixty five dollars, and I had results in three or four days. Great. So yeah, I mean you can add on anything. Lead is seven dollars. Um, all of the metals is another forty six dollars. So it's a good idea to do mostly out of curiosity. And again, this is the kind of thing you probably don't need to test more than 
once. Because your aquifer is not going to change unless, of course, you have a shallow well again. The aquifer usually won't change. Once you have a certain amount of lead in the water, a certain amount of, of you know, arsenic, whatever, it'll never change. But usually in this area, according to the geological survey, it's not a high arsenic area, it's not a high lead area. We're not usually concerned about really anything sulfates. So the soil water and plant testing lab is your resource for, for chemical testing. They do, that'll give you the E. coli test and that other, what's that other word? The coliform? Was listed right under E. coli. The pseudomonas. Oh, the pseudomonas. That's yet another separate one. And that what we usually start with is a coliform. And that's what my lab does. We don't do the chemistry. What the other lab does not do what your lab does. Correct, correct. They don't do they don't do the bugs. So essentially, if you if you want the entire <coughs> package, it'll take two bottles to do it, and you'll have to go to two different labs. Yes. I realize you're not a like medical doctor, but um, that that page that had the pseudomonas and the E. coli and all that. Let's say that it was in your water and you were infected, and you weren't sure. Like, if you take a general antibiotic, would that kill all that stuff inside your body? Uh, probably not. Um, and the, and the, reason, the reason for that is we, we have E. coli in our body. We have, I mean, our, our feces are, by, by weight, by weight, 8% bacterial weight. So of, of, of all of the weight there, 8% of that is bacterial bodies and 90% of that is E. coli. So we really can't take a targeted antibiotic for E. coli or it strips our system. Usually when you feel that you're infected with something in the water, um, you'll, you'll have to go in and, and give a stool sample. We'll be able to analyze what's going on. Um, and then give you a more targeted antibiotic. Well, how do you know if you're just like getting old or? <laughs> <laughs> that part we know for sure. <laughs> That's not a question. <laughs> no, usually the E. coli is, and, and uh, most, most of the E. coli, is, the, the biggest characteristic for that is bloody stool. Oh goodness! Okay. So that that would be, and then the pseudomonas. The the biggest symptom of that is folliculitis. Just basically your your hair follicles being infected and turning red and bony. Goodness. So you'll you'll know. <laughs> you'll know. Your, your doctor will know. They'll go. Pseudomonas. <laughs> So the other thing we kind of have to worry about are the taste and odor problems. And some of the taste and odor problems are actually the iron bacteria that we find in the bottom of the well. They can really impart either a sulfur smell, or you can actually get that, you know, that tinny kind of, kind of a, a blood taste from a high iron. Um, the tannins usually, we again will see it often on more shallow wells, um, or if they're being impacted by surface water. Tannins come from obviously degrading organic material. That's the humic acids from the soil, things like that. So if the well water turns a little bit um, darker, browner during the summer, during the spring, it's usually some impact from surface water. Again, if you have a very deep well, odds are very good that you won't change color in your well very much. The aquifer in general, depending on what is supplying that aquifer, can change color somewhat over the year, but generally not. Usually we see that on, on springs, definitely surface water. Fort Collins, every spring, they have to deal with brown water, and, and they get complaints about it all the time. Can you just clarify what you would consider a deep well versus a not deep well? Absolutely, a deep well is anything considered under uh, over 50 feet. So most of us have pretty deep wells, but I know some of us have fairly shallow ones too. We have a pretty deep well, and, it, and our water turns orange every spring. That's transparent. Yeah, those rain snow. Well, again, that can be from infusion from water up above. So if you have if you have your well head, usually the water shouldn't be sliding down the outside of your of your casing. 
but it can. And again, that's one of the very, very important things. Even if you have a deep well, make sure that that wellhead is, is crowned and that water definitely flows away from it. I've seen, well, actually with the big Thompson flooding, that was one of the biggest problems that they had because people had wells basically in puddles. Mm -hmm. And if a wellhead is sitting in a puddle, mm -hmm. that, that surface water can run down the outside of that shaft. So it's something to protect. And the coloration usually is, is transient. It, it's, it's, it's going to go away. And it doesn't have anything but meat material. It's usually, it's usually not microbial. If it persists throughout the year, it could be an, an iron-related bacteria, that sort of thing. And again, if, if it doesn't go away, the best way to deal with it is to shock it. Well water testing. And again, we, we've covered this a little bit. but. One of the most important things as far as the bacterial test is that you start out with a sterile container. A lot of times I get people bring water samples in you know, water bottles or mason jars or any number of things. You'd be surprised at what I've gotten water samples in over the years. The key though really is I want to be able to test what's in your well and not what was in that mason jar. <coughs> So, you know, you can clean it out, you can go in and scrub it, you can put it in the dishwasher, and that'll work, but we have these at the lab and they don't cost a thing. Did you bring some for us to take? That <laughs> 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 it? That's, that's, and now for a word from our sponsor. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> so, the sterile bottles are, are, are free. Now, when you pick one of these guys up, you're going to see some white powder in there. That is sodium thiosulfate. All that does is neutralize chlorine. We don't have chlorine, but well, in your distribution systems, you may have chlorine. So all that does is kill whatever chlorine is in there. If we don't have chlorine in our else, it doesn't harm the bugs at all. Mostly that's for chlorinated water supplies. A lot of people will uh, take a sample, and by the time it gets into the lab, the residual chlorine in there has killed any of the bugs. And in fact, we do a lot of well waters for real estate transactions, obviously. When you buy a house, you have to know if the well works. In fact, the state of Colorado, my lab is certified by the state, so it means rigorous quality control, blah, 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 on, on and on and on. They mandate, yes sir? I think you can get uh, bottles from the HOA here. Yeah, we got a bottle oh. like that, and, uh, and had that. It's for Larimer County, so I mm -hmm. guess it's probably the same. Same bottle. White powder in the bottom. Absolutely. Yeah. The office is closed right now, so please don't go. Over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I did bring a few, and, and it's great that you guys have them. So yeah. it, it, it's easy to easy to get your hands on. The state mandates that we use these type of bottles because there's been shenanigans. Imagine that. People would actually take their bottle, water bottle sample in their mason jar and microwave it. You microwave this and it melts. So that's, the state tells us we have to use these flimsy bottles here. I've had water samples come in for real estate transactions. You open them up, and you can smell the chlorine from an arm. So. Um, as I recall, we, we use the cold water and the hot water. But you said that getting water from your hot water Peter, can, there could be contaminants in the hot water heater, so which, which do we use, the cold or the hot or both? Generally, it, it's very rare. It depends, I mean, if you have the hot water heater set fairly low, then it can be a concern. But generally the water is hot enough in there that it's gonna kill most of us. So you really don't have to worry too much about the hot water heater, unless we're seeing some other symptomology. If, if we don't see where this is coming from. So now where do we, where do we actually get this from? My preference is the, is the very first sample that you take is to go to whatever faucet that you use most to drink from. To your kitchen faucet, okay? Now a lot of times we have to worry that about the pipes. What's the condition of the pipe? <coughs> so if we get a positive on your kitchen sink, the first thing I'll have you do is go home and take another sample at the wellhead. And that way we can find out is the well good and the distribution lines bad, including the cistern. I mean, we've actually had to go back and track is it, is it the well 
Is it the cistern? Is it the lines after the cistern? Mm -hmm. And that helps. Or you can just run chlorine through the entire thing. So it's usually a good idea. So with this, really, really easy procedure. Your bottles, our bottles. People that are out in the sticks, I usually say when they go through town, stop by a pharmacy and get a sterile urine cup. They're 50 cents. Or these are free. So easy enough to do. So essentially, you want to start with a sterile container. Find, find ideally, again, you want to test what's coming through the water. You're testing the water and not what's in, in the plumbing. So get a faucet that doesn't swivel because swivel faucets can tend to have gunk in, in that swivel. You take the aerator off. You don't want to sample the gunk that's in the aerator. Let that run for three to five minutes. Ideally, that three to five minutes, and again, could be a math problem, but you want the water to run from at least the pressure pump through the lines to your sink. You want water that's coming as fresh as possible. And you could let it run for 10 minutes, depending on whether you're buying the house or selling the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, you want to let it run for a while. Because we're actually ideally testing the well. Then just fill it up. Don't rinse it, because it'll rinse out the sodium thiosulfate. Just fill it up once, fill it up to the line, put it in the refrigerator, and bring it to me within 24 hours. The EPA requires that I test this within 24 hours after collection. <coughs> And then you'll get results in 24 hours. I put these guys in the incubator, and 24 hours later, if they come out with, I don't know if you'll be able to see them in here, these are positive coliforms. They're green, shiny colonies. This is what I'm looking for. I'll take it into the lab, and I'll run it through my membrane filter. There are other methods. Oh yeah, coliform, we'll go back, we'll find that. So, this is what I run it through. I put a little membrane on here. It's a 45 micrometer mixed cellulose acetate. Runs the water through, put it in the incubator 24 hours later. If you have a green dot on there, it's a fail. If there's no green dots on there, it's pass. So pass these around, they're sealed, so don't take the tape off and let it go. <laughs> Okay, so but anyway, you'll, you'll know within 24 hours. And again, chemical testing, soil water, and plant test all that. Do you use the same, if you're going to go to those two different labs you're talking about, do you use the same container? In fact, for them, they love mason jars. Oh. Yeah, they, they, they have buckets of mason jars that they give away twice a year. Okay. It, does, it doesn't matter if, they're, if the water is sterile for them. Okay. We do, so we're looking for bugs, so... It, it matters for us. So mason jars, water bottles, work fine for them. So just a little bit of, of basic microbiology. Coliform bacteria is a general broad grouping, and that's what we look for. That's what the EPA requires, that there be no coliforms. You have fecal coliforms and E. coli. So a lot of people will come in and say, I want a total coliform and an E. coli test. You don't need a total coliform. If your total coliforms are negative, your E. coli is negative. If your total coliforms are positive, we'll automatically look for E. coli. So that's just the way it is. A lot of people get confused and say, I want to test for everything. Well, we'll test for total coliforms. That's always the best start. And if you have total coliforms, then we'll start tracking back and looking for other things that could be a problem. Um, sources of coliform bacteria, they, they can come from generally everything. They're very much... In the soil, coliforms are, are plants, I'm sorry, um, different types of plants will have fairly high concentrations of, of coliform, but essentially what the EPA says, if we have any coliform in there, it's telling us that there's been some lack of sanitation. It doesn't mean that you have E. coli, and again, that's why we look for E. coli if we find the coliform bacteria. If we find coliforms, there could be E. coli in there. We look for E. coli, and a lot of times it's just going to be a soil-based coliform. And nine times out of 10, you don't even need to worry about shocking your well. And that's one of the reasons we do an actual enumeration on the bugs. If you take your water sample into the county, they'll tell you pass or fail, okay? We can do that as well, it costs the same, but it doesn't give you that base information. One of those plates that I'm passing around has one coliform 
What I would tell you in the report is, this is not potable. Try flushing your system for 10 minutes and taking another sample. One of those samples has 11, 12 colonies on there. I would say your, sample, your water is not potable, shock your well. So what the presence absence does, what these guys do, E. coli, okay. Um, there's, there's two ways to test. The county, in fact, I'm the last of two labs in the state that do the actual count because it gives people more information. And besides, it's more microbiology -y. The other one, you just you pour the water in there and if it's yellow the next day, it's a fail. So one colony or 15,000 colonies will give you a fail. You don't know how bad the water is. And that's why I always do a count. I can tell you it's not very bad or it's, it's horrible. Don't drink the water. So E. coli, um, again, we talked about this a little bit. If you have E. coli, it indicates fecal contamination. That's why we very, very, very rarely find it in wells. But it can be. And usually, when we do find it, we find that it's a breakdown of sanitation somewhere in the house. Usually it's a cross connection, or that the well, the, the sanitary seal on the well has been broken. You have water infiltration from the, from the wellhead. Very rarely do we ever see E. coli in the well. Anybody here from Red Feather? Okay, well, in Red Feather, <laughs> <laughs> I'll drink the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Biggest problem with Red Feather is there's there's a lot of houses, a lot of cottages, a lot of everything. So you have well septic, well septic, well septic, well septic, well septic. Mm -hmm. There are are a few places that we've tested in the village that do not have potable water at all. But again, there's ways to deal with that. People that are typically on spring systems, you know, in the, in, the, in the winter when they're not getting a lot of infiltration from the soil, water is pristine. Groundwater comes up, surface water starts coming up, their well, their spring gets flooded, so they use disinfection techniques. And it works fine. So if you have well systems, um, and again, I've seen this in Hedges <coughs> Park, it just depends. Some of these old school constructions, they didn't, they didn't count off 100 feet between the septic and the well. So, and that's, red feathers get a lot <laughs> Okay, so we talked about presence, absence, modified substrate. These are just what I, I use. They're just different sampling methods. I would recommend, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're really going through just a quick and dirty, I would do a presence, absence. Is it positive? Is it negative? If you're really concerned about what's going on, or if you feel that you might have some symptomology, let's find out. I know, you said. Um, <laughs> let's find out how much you've got. And here's the advantages. Blah blah. blah. This is this is one I use on other lectures, but it's it's just really cool. We can change that media. We can look for salmonella. We can look for listeria. We can look for shigella just by whatever auger we put in there. So. It's just a super versatile method. And you just run it through the filter. This is designed to do an incubator that you can do plug into your car. So we used to do some Alpine studies a um, long time ago. Okay, this is what lead leaching out of lead pipes and tiles. I knew I had a picture somewhere. This, these, these are not from Flint, Michigan. <laughs> these were from the Oval at CSU. Oh. Some of the piping around the oval at CSU is ancient and, and very much tons of lead pipe. So in replacing these, we took some pictures. But again, the problem comes with the pH changes, where you start leaching that metal out of it. OK. So how do we kill the bugs? Let's talk about getting rid of bugs first. Because generally, that's what we do. Now, it, it's like I said, if you do have coliform, if you do have E. coli, even if it's persistent, there's ways to get rid of it. But the first way, usually, is to shock the well. Shocking the well, again, it's recommended once a year. I don't think Bobby and I have done it yet. So, even if you talk to your well driller, they'll recommend to do it every two or three years because those iron bacteria, 
whether you know they're there in there or not, can start degrading the pump. So it's a good idea. It's really not that difficult to do. So what you really want to do, and again, peroxide, we can talk about if you have a pseudomonas infection in your system, but generally chlorine. You can look on the internet and find any number of ways to shock a well. Basically, you want to try to figure out, and here's where the geometry comes in, you want to try to figure out how much water is in your well. And that's pi r squared. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to go back and calculate, okay, I've got cubic inches, now I have to change that to gallons. But the easiest way to do that is you tell me, okay, I've got a static head of 32 feet and a four inch pipe, and I'll tell you, you need a half a cup of chloride. Because I've got, I've got the chart, I've got the number. <laughs> so it's usually pretty easy. Your goal is 100 parts per million Clorox, which is really not that much. It's usually pretty easy. So the, the basic way to do it, and, and you can buy pellets. Um, I, I looked on the internet, some of the things say, you drop pellets in, listen for the clunk, drop another pellet in, listen for the clunk. So you can use pellets and it goes down all the way to the bottom of the well. In fact, it'll sink usually through the water column and sit down at the bottom of the well. Using liquid chlorine bleach can be a little bit of a, a problem because you have to actually open the wellhead, pour the chlorine in there, and then you have to go keep it all hooked up. You can't undo the electricity or anything because you've got to go turn your hose on and start running it through the hose. So what you want to do is first circulate it through that well. So you pour your required amount of chlorine bleach in there or you drop your pellets in and then you circulate it with a garden hose and let that circulate around until you start to smell bleach. Then close the well back up, go in and turn every faucet on in your house. And every faucet you want to start smelling chlorine. As soon as you smell chlorine out of that thing, shut it off. Let that sit a minimum of six hours, ideally overnight. And in the morning, turn on every faucet, let it drain until you start, until you don't smell the chlorine. Really a simple process. Inexpensive, yes? Can you, it sounds simple, but then explain, because this is our dilemma, can we have a cistern? Because we have a cistern and it's a whole lot of It is. So with, with the cistern, it can become a challenge as well. A lot of times what I'll recommend, again, we need to find the origin of the contamination. So usually when you have a cistern and your, your kitchen sink fails, the first thing that I'll have you do is take another sample pre-cistern. If you can get one at the wellhead or the outside spigot before it gets to the cistern, nine times out of 10, the well is fine, the cistern has become contaminated. My question, I get that because that is complicated. The question is, in terms of, we couldn't find at the time when we did it any instructions for shocking the system that included if you had a cistern. Oh, indeed. Because when you just gave those those instructions, if you open and you wait till the chlorine comes, it's actually having to go through a cistern that has a ton of water, so the, the rules don't apply. And we couldn't find anywhere where we found really proper instructions about that. In that case, shock the cistern. Don't even worry about jobs. We shot the whole thing, but sure. But it, but usually, like I said, it's it's usually not the well. It's it's usually the system. Okay. So you pour the bleach right into the system. Yeah. Okay. Great. Can you do that and not, not have to worry about shocking the well? Um, it's usually a good start. Again, what if if it becomes a chronic problem, we'll make sure that the well is okay. We'll test the well, and then we'll test from the cistern. So we'll know where the contamination is. Usually it's not the well. If, but it, you, if you don't have a problem, do you need to shock the well? And again, well drillers recommend it once a year. I don't think it's that necessary. I'd say every other year, every three years, every 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but if, yeah, if you don't have a problem, then I'd probably go, nah, and then wait till you're home. I would I would try to understand where the problem is. Okay. I mean, if you if you if you're going to go through the process of shocking, it's easy enough. And, and if you do have a cistern, to go ahead and start the shock at the well, run it through with your garden hose, 
And then when you start to smell the water coming into your cistern, you're fine. Pour some more bleach into the cistern directly and then let that mix. So that's, that's usually the way. But when it comes down to shocking the well, if you get a well rotter result that says it's not potable, just give me a call. And we can talk through it step by step. Or I can direct you. And in fact, every time I give a non-potable report, I include an instruction for shocking the well. So it, it, it's relatively straightforward. It's not a bad idea. Now, the people that have chronic problems, or in the case of your security <coughs> system, they're required to chlorinate. Even though the water is, is tested, basically just because of the long distribution lines, just like Fort Collins or, or any other city, they don't have coliforms in the, in the, I mean, once they purify the water at the treatment plant, they don't have coliforms. But any leak in the soil, any time a pipe is broken, you can get intrusion of coliform bacteria, you can get intrusion of soil, whatever, into the distribution lines themselves. So systems require chlorination. We have uh, at our CSU Mountain Campus, we have something very similar to, to what the, your distribution system is. We have one single well, and it has to be chlorinated to, dis, you know, to be distributed throughout campus. So that's, I mean, distribution systems, you have to chlorinate. But there's other ways to do it. You can have an in-home chlorine injection, and this is what one of my clients in Evergreen did. He found out that his neighbor's septic was three feet from his well. Oh. He never knew about it before. He just couldn't come up. Every test he brought in, it was, he, it was a fail. So he finally went in, looked at the old city plots, and found out that it was three feet away. So what he did was use a chlorine injection system. All of these treatment plans, problems, are very expensive. But it comes down to whether you want to haul water or use your well. And even hauling water can be problematic because, yes, sir? If, if your well is, say, 350, 500 feet, do you have to worry about a neighbor's septic system that might be bad or close by? No. Okay. No. The, the biggest concern, though, is, you, I mean, how, how much downhill is that? I mean, your leach field, if, if your leach field is above your well, you can get water cooling in and coming down the case. But that's, not, that's usually not much of a problem. Generally, if you're if you're uphill and 100 feet away, which is which is the law, you're you're going to be okay, especially with a deep well. Um, UV light. Uh, I know somebody up here, one of the gates. It's a friend of friend of ours that they are on a spring, and they use UV light. UV light works like a champ. What happens with UV light is as the water is passing through this clear tube. You've got ultraviolet lights there, and it nicks the bacterial DNA. Pretty cool. That's how it works. In fact, some uh, municipal systems use UV light. Very clean. There's no disinfectant byproducts. Um, the only problem with it is you have to change the bulb. People put a bulb in, never change them again, and they wonder why they don't have very good water. Yes, we drink the water. Do you use tan? <laughs> no, that's when you're changing the bulb. <laughs> but it, it works like a champ. Ozone, and ozone is, a, is great if you have a cistern. And again, the, one of the easiest ways to do ozone, and if people have chronic problems with a cistern, you can get fancy ozone injection systems for $4,500. What I recommend is going to the hot tub store, buying a hot tub ozone generator, dropping it in there, hmm. and then setting it on a timer that it runs two hours a night. So I, there's a lot of cisterns in northern Colorado that have hot tub ozone machines in them. It works like chance. Silver point of use filters. A lot of people will have the little faucet filters. I would highly recommend throwing those away. <laughs> um, the, the main reason for that is they, they're designed mostly for, for townies to remove chlorine and some of the other taste and odor things. The biggest problem with those guys is a lot of times they'll have charcoal filters in them. Charcoal is a good source of food once you get a whole bunch of bacteria. Uh, Clorox makes Brita. We did 
thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of water through Brita filters. They use silver as a disinfectant. Our South College pool uses silver for a disinfectant. Very effective disinfectant unless you run thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons through there. Sooner or later, we were getting grow through of the filter, which means basically you throw enough bugs on the top, sooner or later they're gonna grow and divide and grow through, and then you're gonna get the same problem coming out of the water. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these point of use filters, they're great for removing taste and odor, they'll remove bacteria, whatever, for a while, but if you don't change them at least as often as the manufacturer recommends, you're actually doing yourself a disservice. Are the refrigerator filters that considered to be a POU? The ones that built into your refrigerator water? They are. Tap? They are. But mainly those are for getting out chunks out of your ice. They're mostly sediment filters. They're not charcoal? They're, no, I don't think any, most any of them are. I don't know. It could be certain types are. But I, again, I recommend changing those. I, I usually don't change mine until my ice cubes start looking like wood. <laughs> <laughs> What about a well, like, we're temporary, and we're not here all the time, so a well doesn't have to pump the water. What's, how do, you, how do we deal with that? That's a very excellent question. If you yeah. didn't hear, you know, what, what if you're up here for only, you know, weekends, or, you know, during the summers, or something like that? <clears throat> very good question. The first thing that I would do, once you get back in the house, open up every tap, and, and let it run for 15 or 20 minutes. Again, that will really help wash out. Most water systems clean themselves pretty well, but you just have to flush them adequately. So, and even, even if, um, you know, I, I would recommend that if you're up once a month that you flush regularly. That's a good point. Um, on the chlorine, on the chlorine. Yes. You said how much should you have for, how much chlorine for the water that you have? For a, for a shock? No, for in general. Oh, for, well, for, if, you, if you're using a chlorine injection system, you want to have less than one part per million. Okay. Typically four columns, and I'm not sure what your system, I'd like to talk to your operator sometime, but for potable water, you're looking for 0.5 parts per million. And what if it's three parts per million? Three parts per million, pools are usually three to five parts per million. A shock is usually 100 parts per minute. So uh, the standard restaurant disinfection, anything over 25 parts per million has to actually be rinsed. 25 parts per million, if you're spraying your countertops, you can basically leave it, leave it on there to dry. So, and again, it, it gets into a, a lot of math that I can explain specifically if you have questions, but uh, a bottle of Clorox is 5.25%. So generally, if you're dealing with a good disinfection, you want 10% 10, 10 leach, which gives you 500 parts per million, which is more than strong enough. So, but as far as drinking water, typically in four columns, uh, the water, at least on campus distribution system, runs 0.3 to 0.7 parts per million. Yes? I always thought that I heard that using Clorox in your system and stuff like that is bad for your leach field because it the bacteria in your leach field? It can, but that's usually for a massive dose of it. You, you would have to essentially pour 10 gallons of bleach into your septic to get it to, to burn your leach. And in fact, the, the most important area is in your septic tank because that's where most of the digestion is done anyway. So you want the active bugs in your septic and then obviously your leach field is just a way to percolate that out slowly. So but it can, it's not a good idea to shock your well once a month. But shocking it once a year, once every other year, once every 10 years. <laughs> 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 as long as you don't die, yeah, don't die. <laughs> so now for some of the other, how many people have sediment filters on their lines? Most people. Yeah, most everybody does. It's, it's the little canister yeah. filter because we do get sediment in. And the reason we get sediment in, in our wells is cleared out of the bottom, 350, 600 feet down, 
you're always going to get some sand that drops in. When the, when the water comes in, it's going to drop some sand in there. The pump sucks it up, pours it through your house, and you get chunks in your eyes if you don't have an ice filter. <laughs> so essentially, a sediment filter, most houses have them. The case, the housing, whatever, is usually about 100 bucks. If you have some little taste and odor problems, a lot of houses will have a sediment filter, and then you'll have a uh, charcoal filter. That will get rid of some of your taste and odor, some of the tannins, some of the colors. So the, the organic the charcoal filter is good for colors, some taste and odor, it'll re remove some of the sulfur, it'll remove some of the um, iron taste and things like that. But again, make sure you change them regularly. In our house, usually we change them when the shower drips really <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, as far as TDS, dissolved solids, it's probably better to use a, a cation exchange. Because a lot of the dissolved solids cannot be filtered out. They're dissolved, they're, they're, they're basically a part of the water. So if you want to do that, uh, first thing, cheapest, um, cheap being relative, is, is doing a water softener. I still have 150 TBS though. Do you still? So, um, cation exchange. It'll go through a resin bed that'll actually pull the minerals out. No, you're supposed to say 150 is not <laughs> 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 I, I would drink it if it was. But again, with, with, with that high, the, the biggest concern with a high dissolved solids like that is, is shrinking of your pipes. The, basically, your, your pipes start to plate those out and you'll start to notice flow problems because your the diameter, the inside diameter of your pipe starts to decrease. And I've even seen little magnets that you can put on those things that are supposed to cure that. But I don't know. I mean I, I don't know. I don't know. So essentially when it comes down to it, it gets more and more and more expensive to, to take care of some of these things. Some of the iron exchange ones are very expensive. Water softeners work. I would recommend, again, testing your water once, and if there are very high numbers, and there are, there are very good standards, the EPA, I have standards here that you know, we can talk about, but if the water is over the standard, then it's a good idea to start at your very basic and work down towards some of the very expensive. When you get down to something like RO, you've completely removed all of the bacteria, you completely removed all of the metals, everything, you're essentially dealing with deionized water, which is not good for you because it is such an ion scavenger, it is such a pure water that it leaches metals out of your own pipes. So I really recommend that people do not ever drink distilled water. It's not, it's not good for them, you need the minerals in there. I was told reverse osmosis water is there isn't even any water it's just wet <laughs> <laughs> i think you're right yeah. i think you're right so but you you really lose a lot of the the minerals that you know are, are beneficial in well water and let me see gc other problems and you know hopefully you guys don't have this one of our neighbors thought he had a a, a broken well um, he thought he was getting ready to re-drill another well for fifteen or twenty-five thousand dollars, but lo and behold, one of the distribution pipes that came from the well from the pump was broken. So it would work for a while, and then the pipe would leak, and he wouldn't have any more water. So a lot of times, it's it's a good idea to figure out what's going on with the pipes before you go back. I mean, his well, his pump was running, but he just wasn't getting enough water. After 10 minutes, he wouldn't get any more water. That's because it was all squirting out, out the side of the pipe. <laughs> so, so there's you know, pumps. Um, the life of a pump is supposed to be 15 years. 
Um, I replaced I replaced a pump. The life of a well in general is 30 to 70 years. So, and and obviously there are wells that last much much longer than that. But they they do eventually fail. Um, low flow problems, and that was one of the uh, you know a lot of people with uh, poor recovery rates use cisterns because they have to. They don't have the good recovery rate. A flow rate is completely different than a recovery rate. The flow rate is, is directly related to how big your pump is. So the stronger the pump, the faster the water flows. But it all depends on how fast that water percolates back into the well from the aquifer, from your, from your rocks. What do pumps cost now? It's for replacing a pump, it's two to $4,000. Well, I think we're on at least borrowed time. Borrowed time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. well, so, it's still working. Well, as long as it's still working, and again, one of the things that, well, that's a caveat. For a very old well, it's sometimes not a good idea to shock because the only thing that's holding it together. <laughs> 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 okay, <I'm not> sure. <laughs> so, but, but realistically, to prolong the life of your pump, you should shock the well. Well, I don't think we've done very well on shockers. Yeah, so... Done once. Okay, then I, I really wouldn't worry about it because when you replace that pump, you will have to. I mean, it's just, just part... When you replace a pump, you have to shock the well. It's, it's to sanitize the system. It's just part of the replacement. This ballpark, if, you're, if you have... Most people have four-inch pipes for the, for the well. So if you're dealing... Well... A four inch pipe, every, every two feet of water, ha every two feet of depth has about a gallon of water. A six inch pipe, every foot and a half has a gallon of water. So most, uh, most of the volumes, the, the, the uh, static volume is usually about 40 to 50 feet. So what I recommend to people just without doing any calculations is a half a gallon of bleach. It's, it's, it's the easiest calculation. If you have a super deep well with a, with a lot of static volume, pour in a whole gallon. Yeah, just okay. straight chloride bleach. Okay. Um, some of the methods say go down to your pool store or your, I mean, you can, you can buy these things over the internet, but you can get solid pellet disinfections, disinfectant, and then you drop in about 50 pellets. So it's, without calculating it, the best rule of thumb is a half gallon. Unless you have a super deep well, which is... I would just go, go with a gallon. But how deep is a super deep well? 600 feet. Okay. It really, it doesn't matter how deep the well is, really. It depends on how much standing water you've got in the well. Yeah. And that's really difficult to know. I mean, really, the, the only way to really do that is to work with your well driller or someone like that because what you have to do is basically send a, a probe down there until it touches the top of the water and then you have to send the probe down further until it hits the bottom of the well and then you can it. It's a tricky measure. So you can't overshock your well? Well, the only, the only concern with overshocking your well really comes down to blasting your septic. So when it comes down to it, you can, you know, pour it out onto your, you know, gravel road or something like that. But uh, you can't overshock it, but I mean, that would be on the order of three gallons per, per well, which would be massive. Well, we do. Okay, so prevention, I know I'm about out of time here. Obviously, don't use pesticides, don't dump oil around your wellhead. There is a potential it can run down the jacketing, on the exterior of the jacketing. Make sure that the drainage around your well drains away. Um, make sure it's all, all located well. Um, if you know that your septic's too close, it may be prudent to, to, you know, if you go by an RO system, you could probably have drilled another well. And then well maintenance. Take care of it. Um, you know, have, have, have it shocked every now and again. Um, you test your water, and again, the EPA recommends that you test your well once a year. I do because it's free. <laughs> 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 so I, I, 
<laughs> Must be time to take a bottle. Of <laughs> so, but I'm really I'm I'm, a, I'm here as a resource, and that's yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah that's me. A long time ago, we used to test horse tooth as well. But, <laughs>